chest injuries. Chest injuries are a a major a major finding in trauma. Some of the most serious life threats that you're going to deal with as an EMT will be uh, treating patients with chest injuries. Your success in treating them depends on your assessment skills, your knowledge of chest injuries. Doing a head-to-toe examination of a patient uh, using DCAP BTLS, it's a great thing. It gives you it gives you information that you need to process to determine the injuries that your patient has, but without the foundation of of the knowledge of chest injuries, what signs and symptoms uh, lead you to develop an impression as to what your patient's problem is and how to treat that uh, without without having that uh you're just poking around on somebody you're you're not being a complete clinician so let's go through uh, some anatomy and physiology uh, then we'll move to pathophysiology uh, some specific chest injuries as well as treatments if you have a question at any time just pop your microphone on and let me know other than that we will move on what types of chest injuries are there we have blunt versus penetrating trauma chest wounds blunt trauma is just blunt force impacting the chest and and then transferring in energy into the chest wall and then on into the internal structures of the chest. Penetrating trauma is the other type. Uh, that is exactly what it sounds like, just something that penetrates from the outside through the chest wall and subjects the organs and structures on the inside of the chest to trauma. I do see a really high instance of critical patients with penetrating chest trauma, as well as a lot of deaths. Uh, recognizing what has, what, what specific injuries have been caused by that penetrating trauma is going to guide your treatment and that is going to direct you as far as your transport decision, where you need to transport your patient, who you need to notify, who you might need to call in as additional resources to give your, your patient the best outcome possible. Open chest wound, that would be a type of penetrating trauma. Open chest wounds, uh, when I see that, I think about like a knife slash across the chest that, that makes it through intercostal muscles and down into that chest cavity. Could also be uh, something like an industrial accident, uh, Maybe the guards left off a big fan and person uh, walks into that fan and that slices through the through the chest and causes extensive damage on the inside. Then impaled objects, so that's another type of penetrating trauma. Uh, something that, such as a knife that stabbed through that chest wall and it's still there, or you have a patient, those are easier. It's it's easier to try to get some sort of occlusive dressing around that knife and stabilize that, stabilize that knife in place than it is if you have someone on a construction site who falls from a height and they're impaled on a piece of rebar, and maybe that rebar, it's been hammered into the ground and it's deep in the ground, and 
you have that patient on top of that and you're trying not to move that because we don't remove impaled objects and you have a rescue rescue crew there with you who's trying to figure out how to cut that thing off underneath and then clip that down, cut that down closer to the chest so that you can pack around both sides, try to get an occlusive dressing around that and get that patient ready to transport. Those can be really challenging injuries. Those are horrible injuries uh, in part uh, as bad as it sounds to the rest of the world. Uh, that's kind of why we came here because those are the challenges that we want to be able to meet on behalf of our patient and succeed in our treatment and give that person a chance to live another day, return to their lives, return to their families. That's why we do what we do, right? We want to, when the chips are down, be the, the calm, collected professional. Everybody looks to, to step up, deal with the situation, and get that person to a trauma center so that they can be treated and return to their lives. Uh, sometimes they even send us nice letters. If nothing else, you walk away feeling like you really did something great for someone. They don't always come shake our hands. They don't always send letters of thanks. I, down inside, they appreciate what we've done for them. And we get to walk away feeling like we, we did something good for our fellow man. So that's why we do what we do. Pathophysiology, remember that is the that is the effect of an injury or a disease on the functioning of the human body. Uh, we, uh, we assess our patients. We look at the mechanism of injury. That gives us an index of suspicion of a specific pathophysiological issue that our patient's having so we can then manage that. Uh, again, blunt forces penetrating mechanisms of injury. Uh, hemothorax, uh, I don't know why I put that word here. We'll just give you a thumbnail sketch of it. Hang on, this is tough. I know you guys can follow it. That is blood accumulating in the chest cavity. Uh, just uh for double jeopardy someday when you're trying to you're on TV and trying to win money from Alex Trebek in an adult average size adult each half of the chest or hemithorax can can hold up to about a liter and a half of blood 1.5 liters of blood it's a lot of blood uh, pneumothorax we can have an open pneumothorax from penetrating trauma. We could have a closed pneumothorax, say from a rib fracture, and that that fractured rib displaces and it penetrates through the the pleura and maybe even down into the lung, and air starts escaping into that pleural space in the chest. And as that air accumulates, that's what we call a pneumothorax. Simple pneumothorax, that just involves one side of the chest, usually involves a lower percentage of the chest, but it stays isolated to that one side. Sometimes those don't even require a chest tube or surgical intervention. Just depends on the patient. It depends on how much air, depends on possibly if they have underlying medical conditions. So all those things come into play. We don't always know those. We get a trauma patient with nobody around to give us a sample history. We don't know what meds they take. We don't know what past pertinent medical history we they have. Sometimes we're just almost flying blind with regard to the overall medical condition of our patient prior to 
our encounter with them. We can only work off of information we have, so we do the best that we can. Uh, as you get more experience as a clinician, you learn to to look at a patient and get some idea of some things that, that they possibly have. For instance, a COPD patient, uh, you learn to, to look at them and determine if they're a blue bloater or a pink puffer. Uh, they have a specific appearance. Uh, we talked about those in the respiratory chapter. It takes some experience and seeing some patients to put that together and start to understand the things that you learn and how to look at a patient and get a get a good idea as to whether they maybe they have that specific uh, medical history. An easy one is a great big surgical scar right down the middle of somebody's chest. Well, that, that one's pretty easy. That person has had cabbage at some point. They've had a a, a, a coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So that that that's easy. You know that patient has an underlying cardiac condition that has been hopefully treated surgically. Uh, they may still have cardiac problems with that go with that. So you have a little more information there. Uh, so those things would come into play possibly with how how well your patient deals with having that simple pneumothorax. As a simple pneumothorax progresses, if air keeps escaping into that one side of the chest cavity, that hemithorax, that can start to compress the lung on one side and fill that cavity, then start to displace the the structures in the mediastinum, that area between the two lungs, the what it, that contains the the heart, the 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 trachea, the esophagus, the great vessels, the the superior vena cava, and the aorta. So as that progresses and starts to displace that. Uh, We'll talk, we'll talk in detail in a minute about how that affects those structures in the mediastinum, what that does to our patient's overall condition. That can even reach the point that that tension pneumothorax extends over into the other side of the chest and starts to compress that lung so that you have extensive extensive pathophysiology uh, of, of this chest injury that without intervention is going to, in the end, uh, cause, cause that patient to die. And our goal is to recognize that and get the appropriate, treat, provide the appropriate treatment at the BLS level, recognize when we need to involve ALS to do things such as perform a needle decompression, that pleural decompression, to help get some of that air out of the chest and then provide that rapid transport to a trauma center for surgical treatment and intervention. So we'll talk more, we'll talk in detail about those things in a minute. Uh, moving on, we're going to discuss cardiac tamponade, pericardial tamponade, that's blood filling up the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart as that blood accumulates it compresses the heart interferes with refill in the in the ventricles and compromises cardiac output we'll talk about signs and symptoms of that how to recognize it what we what we need to do to provide treatment for that patient till we can get them to a surgeon at a trauma center. Rib, fac rib fractures, uh, those may be simple rib fractures that aren't displaced, that they hurt, but they're not gonna cause a life threat. It could be extensive rib fractures. It could be even be uh, moving on down to that, that 
that next bullet point could be a flail chest, two or more consecutive ribs fractured in two or more places. And that flail chest, we have a specific way to recognize that, that has a specific impact on our patients. And we'll talk about how to recognize that, how to treat that, exactly what we need to do for those patients. Then Commodio cordis, that sounds like, to me, that sounds like a big lizard. I, it's always, sound, that's a Komodo dragon. But I don't know, Commodio cordis has always reminded me of a big lizard. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about uh, how that comes about and what can be done to manage a patient who is in cardiac arrest secondary to, to this specific injury. Okay, let's slide on. Get We always have to get some statistics, right? I, I don't know why I love leaving these statistics in here. I, I just want you to see that uh, chest trauma, in this case, is a big deal. I mean, that, we're pushing three-quarters of a million emergency department visits per year from chest trauma, with 18,000 of those resulting in death. That doesn't include patients who have things like uh, an aortic aortic shear that just rips their aorta and causes them to bleed out instantly on the scene, and they're dead on the scene. So that's not even included in this statistic. I will talk in a minute about, uh, I believe, the statistic for that that's going to come up is about one-third of the out-of-hospital deaths with patients dead on the scene from chest trauma are the result of an aortic tear that, that kills our patients. So that is, that's a major deal. Uh, chest injuries can range from that simple rib fracture all the way up to extensive blunt force trauma or penetrating trauma that damages the heart the lungs, the great vessels in the in the chest, uh, in that in the mediastinum, and those can have uh, catastrophic results for our patients. Our job is to recognize them and provide stabilizing treatment and get them to that trauma center, so the so the man or woman with the knife can do something about it. All right. Uh, we need to immediately treat injuries that interfere with normal breathing function. Uh, that may be that our patient has a, a penetrating chest wound, they have a sucking chest wound, so that as they breathe in and out, uh, you can hear blood, you can hear air going in and out, in and out of that wound in the chest. Well, from day one, when we taught you about that the trauma assessment algorithm, we told you if, if you have a penetrating wound to the chest that is a sucking chest wound, you hear that air going in and out, you pop your gloved hand over that, and you hold that there until somebody can get an, an, an occlusive dressing for you to put over that so that we can stop more, more air from entering that chest cavity and then we're going to provide positive pressure ventilation, hopefully to force some of that air back out, but uh, and also to ventilate that patient. Uh, so uh, back to that that hemothorax. Let's think about what I call the hemithorax, one, one side of the chest. Again, that can hold up to about 1,500 milliliters of blood in the average size adult. Why is that significant? That represents over 25% of the total circulating blood volume in the average adult. <clears throat> Why is that significant? That's significant because... Thinking back to our chapter uh, on trauma, the tra trauma overview chapter and shock, we talked about the, the human body being able to compensate for 
blood losses, rapid blood losses of up to 20%, well, 25, even where I went to high school, is more than 20. So that 25% is, that is a significant blood loss. Uh, you lose that, filling up that, that one side of the chest. We have a patient who is going to quickly move into decompensated shock and their condition is going to deteriorate or crash, as we call it. They're going to crash. We're going to soon have a patient who's in cardiac arrest. Let's say that that's a pediatric patient. Remember what we talked about with pediatrics. They compensate well. They compensate longer in shock. And then I always call it, they just fall off a cliff. They don't deteriorate and have a gradual slide down to cardiac arrest, they go from compensating straight to cardiac arrest. So we have less time to try to intervene and, and provide treatment that is going to make a difference and, and hopefully provide a positive outcome. We'll talk a lot more about pediatric, pediatric assessment in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we won't get too deep into that right now. Uh, as air accumulates in the chest, or blood, but as air accumulates in the chest, it prevents lung expansion. What does that do? That decreases tidal volume. And with less tidal volume, our patient has less, less oxygen available at the alveolar level, and with less oxygen available, at the alveolar level, our perfusion goes down and then our patients deteriorate. Back to the old difference of the, uh, between ventilation and oxygenation. Uh, okay, here's what you have to remember, even to be a good doctor, that's, that's all you have to remember. Uh, sp from being a good EMT to being a good doctor, air goes in and out, blood goes round and round, if something screws one of them up, your job is to fix. That's all you have to know, right? So ventilation, that's air going in and out. That air can go in and out all day long, but if that oxygenated air isn't making it down to the alveolar level and through, through diffusion, which we also call respiration, uh, through diffusion, that oxygenated air that makes it to the alveoli moves across into onto into the into the bloodstream, and then with that oxygen there, it's able to hopefully combine with hemoglobin, load that hemoglobin, the delivery truck of perfusion for the body is the hemoglobin, so getting that oxygen down to the hemoglobin, uh, that is respiration, that's oxygenation. These chest injuries can interfere with both ventilation and oxygenation. So think about those things as we go through and think about what we do to correct that, what we do to treat that. Uh, you know, you knew from the time you were in grade school, I hope, uh, what the chest is. Maybe you didn't learn till sixth grade science that that's the thorax, and thorax goes from your neck to your diaphragm. So the diaphragm divides your abdomen from your thoracic cavity. What we're talking about today stops at the diaphragm until the second session this afternoon. Okay, that's just a better picture than what I could draw on the board, uh, these are those important structures I've been talking about. Uh, these are the things that that are injured in uh, in the with uh, with the mechanisms injury that we're discussing today. Uh, I want to start getting this in your head now, so that you will remember it when you get to your advanced EMT class and then paramedic school. The the neurovascular bundle, that is a nerve, an artery, and a vein. 
in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the nerves that, that innervate the intercostal muscles so that when a nerve impulse comes down, it causes, it, it causes those intercostal muscles to contract and creates chest rise and that negative pressure gradient allows air to, uh, to pass through and, and hopefully down into the lungs all the way down to the alveoli. That is just under the, the lower margin of each rib. So tucked up under the edge of that. Here's a pre preview for uh, your advanced EMT skills. When we teach you to do pleural decompression, we're going to teach you that we have to go take the needle over the top of each, over the top of the rib where we stick so that we avoid that neurovascular bundle. We don't want to damage a nerve. We don't want to cause an arterial bleed or a, or a, or a, a, a venous bleed right there under the rib if we stick in the wrong place. So that's Pond taking a minute to talk about so that you know what, number one, what a neurovascular bundle is. We have those throughout our body, uh, everywhere we have uh, a nerve and an artery and a vein, that would be a neurovascular bundle. So that neurovascular bundle is under that bottom margin of the rib. We don't ever stick there. We go over the top. We're not learning that today, so I'll keep on moving. Uh, two types of pleura with in, in each side of the chest. You have the parietal pleura that lines the chest, the visceral pleura that is like a piece of cellophane on top of the lung. And if we were able to be in lab and I had a pig lung laying on the table, I would take some forceps and grab that visceral pleura and pull it up so you could see that. But I don't have that in front of me, so we can't do that. We will keep on moving. What does that do? Uh, there's pleural fluid, it's very, very small amount of fluid in that extremely thin space between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura, and that allows for smooth gliding of the lung against the inside of the chest wall during ventilation, right? We should change that word here. Gave me the opportunity to remind you again the difference between ventilation and respiration. Uh, when our patient has a pneumothorax, that area between those two types of pleura is where the air collects that causes the pneumothorax. Just another picture. Uh, functions of the rib cage. Uh, protection for those structures in the in the chest. Uh, the ribs articulate or connect uh, anteriorly with the sternum, with sternocostal cartilage. During chest compressions and CPR, when people say we're breaking every rib in their chest. No, when you feel that popping, except for in in elderly patients with uh, elderly patients who have uh, less pliable rib cage, they don't even have to have osteoporosis. But with osteoporosis or with a, a far less pliable rib cage than what younger patients have, uh, unless we're dealing with those old people, then what people are calling broken ribs are, uh, that's just separation of, of that cartilage, that, that cartilage popping. Uh, better to have popped cartilage than to not have chest compressions, I think. Okay, that's anteriorly. Posteriorly, the, the ribs articulate with the vertebra. And then uh, down with your 11th and 12th rib, those are called uh, free-floating ribs. They don't articulate anteriorly. And then the, our costal arch that the diaphragm 
follows when the diaphragm is relaxed. It kind of goes up along that that uh, costal arch, that costal margin there. Uh, these ribs are they're more posterior, at, and those ribs can uh, the excuse me the intercostal cartilage from those ribs connects uh, wise into cartilage that's come that that's coming down here. So each one of those doesn't have an articulation anteriorly. That's not a big important thing. I don't know why I got hung up on it there. All right, and moving on a little more anatomy and physiology. I've talked about the mediastinum three times now. Why? Because it's important when we get down to uh, dealing with with uh, tension pneumothorax uh, contained in the mediastinum, that area between the lungs. Uh, there's pleura for on the right. There's pleura on the left. In that middle portion, that's where the heart sits. That's where the great vessels are. Uh, remember that the great vessels are the the superior vena cava and the aorta, and then the trachea and esophagus is there. Okay, and then the diaphragm, as we looked at here, that's one of the major muscles of ventilation. So the, the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve. So an impulse comes down the phrenic nerve that stimulates that big dome-shaped muscle that we call the diaphragm. And in ventilation, that causes it to flatten out and combined with intercostal muscle contraction that causes the the chest to move up and out, we create that negative pressure. Uh, neg that pressure gradient create the negative pressure in the chest that allows air to enter the lungs. All right, and it also divides the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Cavity. Intercostal muscles, those are the muscles between the ribs. Those contract at the same time as the diaphragm, as I just said, to help expand the chest, to create that negative pressure in the chest. They relax during exhalation. So inhalation is an active process. And then exhalation is, creates another pressure gradient. The pressure inside the chest is now higher than the pressure outside the chest and that moves the air out. Uh, other things to note, chest injuries can penetrate through to the liver, which actually sits in the abdomen. We'll talk about it in session two, but chest injuries uh, quite often involve on the right involve the the thorax and the structures inside and also the liver so we have another major source of bleeding in our patient okay uh, continuing on with some more of the mechanics of ventilation uh, patients who suffer cervical spine injuries that result in damage to the spinal cord. If the injury is at C5 or below, the diaphragm can still contract and that patient is able to breathe normally, even though they have paralysis further down, uh, maybe they lose the, the function of their legs, they lose sensation, uh, they lose function there. Uh, they, and well, and in the upper extremities also, if it's C5 or above, then they should still, still be able to breathe on their own. Uh, patients with a cord injury 
at C3 or above, that may paralyze the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm, and then they require mechanical ventilation. I'm thinking back to the respiratory chapter, minute ventilation, that is the amount of air moved in and out of the lungs in one minute. Uh, it's also known as minute volume, normal tidal volume times respiratory rate gives you minute ventilation. Let's look at that in, uh, or let's, let's apply that to a patient. We know that normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20 times a minute. I will tell you in an adult, and I will tell you that the normal tidal volume in adults is about five to 600 milliliters. So we do a little bit of simple math. Uh, the average adult has a has minute ventilation of 6,000 milliliters to 12,000 milliliters per minute. Patients with decreased tidal volume, let's say from a pneumothorax, an extensive, even simple pneumothorax that compresses one of the lungs, that decreases the tidal volume that's available for this calculation of minute ventilation. So that causes a compromise in our patients. That normal resting respiratory rate of 12 per minute may go up to that 20 per minute, 24 per minute, 26, 28 per minute to try to compensate for the decrease in minute volume by increasing the respiratory rate to try to get back up to a normal minute ventilation. Injuries of the chest, this is a closed injury. This is a seat belt injury. You can see that, that redness, that uh, erythema is, that, is the name for that redness. You can see that, see that erythema and some abrasions from that seat belt coming across the chest and that rapid deceleration in a motor vehicle collision. Potential for injuries in several ways here. It is possible for a seat belt to fracture ribs and that could cause a rib to penetrate into that pleural cavity and cause a pneumothorax. Uh, think back to trauma overview and deceleration injuries, uh, thinking about first, second, and third collision. First collision, bam, the car hits something. Second collision, the body continues until it hits something. In this case, the seat belt is that something that the body hits, and that stops the body from moving forward. But the organs on the inside of the body continue to move forward. So the organs moving forward inside the chest would be that third collision in that, that motor vehicle collision in this case. So uh, we can see some extensive trauma, some extensive injuries from that. Overall, it's far better than being unrestrained and, and the whole body slamming into whatever that car impacted. Closed chest injury can even cause a pulmonary contusion or a, or a myocardial contusion. What are those? Those are bruises to the organs themselves. A bruise to the heart muscle would be a myocardial contusion. A bruise to the lung itself would be a pulmonary contusion. If the heart's damaged, uh, it may cause the heart to uh, change the electrical activity of the heart that may require some, some intervention at the ALS level. How do we recognize that, that that's possibly what's going on with our patient? Uh, they have chest trauma. They, they appear to be hemodynamically compromised. What does that mean? They're uh, 
they're not blue, moving the normal amount of blood around in the body, so that causes negative changes to the body. Uh, so we have things like a, a falling blood pressure. Uh, that would be a, a sign of, of a, uh, of, of a, a myocardial contusion as well as an irregular pulse. So if we find those, we need to call for ALS, or if ALS isn't available, we need to provide rapid transport of those patients to a trauma center for treatment. Uh, bruise to the lung, uh, that can cause swelling that decreases, it, it, causes, uh, it causes collapse of the alveoli, atelectasis, that's easy for you to see. Uh, it causes atelectasis, which means those alveoli are deflated. They're not participating in, in ventilation and not participating in respiration. So that negatively impacts our patient. And then that can also cause bleeding and and fluid to accumulate within alveoli. So that can have a major impact on our patients. Uh, rib fractures can either be stabilized or displaced, and displaced is going to cause internal damage. Uh, and stable is going to cause a lot of pain, but not require emergency intervention most of the time. Penetrating chest wound, uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Well, no, penetrating chest wound, uh, we're not talking necessarily an open chest wound yet. Uh, it could be a rib that penetrates down and causes a pneumothorax, even a hemothorax or a hemoneumothorax. You can have both of those things happening at the same time, causes uh, causes uh, our patients to uh, decompensate, to go downhill uh, much faster if you have both of those things going on. And you can have a knife, a bullet, a piece of metal, uh, all kinds of things that can penetrate the, the chest cavity and cause injury. If we have an impaled object, it's still there just like we taught you from the start. We don't pull those out. We stabilize those, keep those where they are. When do we remove impaled objects? You'll remember that we don't remove them unless they're interfering with CPR. So we can't do chest compressions because there's a big knife that was sharp enough that it went through that through the sternum or right beside the sternum. Say it's a big, sharp Bowie knife. It's impaled in the chest, uh, and we can't get in there to do chest compressions because of it. We're going to have to pull it out. Uh, it's going to cause more bleeding in the chest. They're going to die without CPR. They may die because we pull the knife out. So that's uh, tough things to weigh out and to decide what to do. Other times we with, with that we remove an impaled object is if it's blocking the airway, uh, interfering with the airway. Blunt trauma can cause the sternum to fracture. That's why we taught you to take that, uh, what Ryan Mays calls the old knife, the old knife hand of the sternum. You take this portion of your hand on the pinky finger side and you put that like a karate chop along the length of the sternum, and you press in to see if you feel any crepitus, if you feel that chest move in an abnormal way, then you may be dealing with a fractured sternum. Think about, think about the sternum is that as a, an extremely tough bone, very hard to fracture. It takes, it takes ungodly amount of energy to fracture the sternum. That energy continues on into the chest, causes injury to the structures in the chest. Could be the heart, could be the lungs, could be the great vessels, could be all of those. So uh, that fractured sternum is 
extremely bad situation. Then fractured ribs, uh, multiple fractured ribs, all of those have, have a negative impact on our patients, sometimes a lethal impact on our patients. And then bruising of the lungs, bruising of the heart, as we mentioned, damage to the aorta, uh, vital organs torn from their attachment in the chest, causing, causing bleeding, interfering with the function of the organ. Signs and symptoms of chest injuries, uh, pain at the site of the injury, uh, could be localized pain uh, that just aggravates them like a fractured rib. It just hurts when I take a deep breath. So what do I do? I don't take a deep breath. Eventually, that can cause pneumonia. That can cause our patient to have a secondary infectious process that can, that can cause them to lose their lives. Uh, so it's important to have fractured ribs assessed at the hospital and treated. Uh, you'll find patients with fractured ribs splinting those. What does that mean? They hold their arm up over that area where the rib fracture is, hold a bent arm up over it and they grab the other arm and push down and try to, to hold that chest wall so it doesn't hurt so bad when they take a, take a deep breath. And then just bruises to the chest wall. Uh, that, that induces pain and that decreases tidal volume because your patient doesn't want to take as deep a breath as normal. We can find crepitus when we palpate the chest. Uh, that's part of, all of these are, are parts of good old DCAP BTLS, right? Uh, penetrating injury to the chest. When you inspect the anterior chest you've done and you palpate the anterior chest, you've only done part of your job, uh, half of your job, I would say. You need to roll that patient and you need to remember IAP, inspect, auscultate, palpate. When you log roll them over, you need to inspect the back of the chest, you need to auscultate the back of the chest, you need to palpate the back of the chest. Your exam isn't done until you've done both sides, all right? Dyspnea, that's shortness of breath. We know what to do for dyspnea, right? Uh, right off the bat, we're gonna provide supplemental oxygen to that patient. With these chest injuries, we're going straight to the non-rebreather mask. We're not gonna jack around with the nasal cannula and going from two liters per minute to three, four, five, six. We're just gonna go straight to the non-rebreather mask and possibly uh, quickly on to a bag valve mask and positive pressure ventilation. Hemoptysis, that's coughing up blood. So injuries to the lung, uh, we, we can see hemoptysis and that is a sign that, that there is something serious going on in the, in the chest that we need to deal with. If we have a patient with hemoptysis, we need to get the bag valve mask out provide positive pressure ventilation, and try to move some of that fluid out of the way and get oxygen as deep as we can down in the lungs when we ventilate the patient. Uh, we look for things like, uh, like uh, one side of the chest that has good rise and fall at, during inst uh, inspiration and expiration, uh, and then we might see the other side of the, the, the chest that doesn't go up and down the same as the side that's working right. Uh, we call that asymmetric chest rise. Uh, it's not rising the same or equally on both sides. That is an, that is an extremely important finding uh, in your assessment uh, that's going to cause you to investigate further to see if that patient has a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. And then rapid weak pulse, low blood pressure, cyanosis, anywhere from just cyanosis in the nail beds to circumoral cyanosis or cyanosis all around the mouth. Hurts when they take a deep breath. We already mentioned that. Uh, there, It's going to compromise their tidal volume because they're not taking that deep breath so they don't have 
as much oxygen available in the alveoli for respiration. So uh, we need to go to that. Uh, two ways to deal with this. Uh, if their breathing is slightly shallow, we could go to a non-rebreather mask. If they have really shallow rapid respirations, they are, mo they are moving toward respiratory failure and we need to get out the bag valve mask for positive pressure ventila ventilation. Uh, we're going to auscultate the lungs. We're going to listen to for equal breath sounds. We're going to listen, uh, remember always, apex, apex, base, base. We're comparing the two sides. Uh, we're listening to see if we hear queezes, if we hear crackles, if we hear those vesicular breath sounds, we know that we have, our patient has, has a big problem. Uh, and then if we hear really wet breath sounds, we hear ronchi, uh, I always have said that it sounds like a, a percolator, the old coffee percolator or a popcorn popper. It's, it's air bubbling through liquid. That patient needs positive pressure ventilation. Let's take a five minute break at scene safety and we'll come back and knock the rest of the way through these chest injuries. So let's take five. Okay, scene safety. That's the same as always. That hasn't changed. Things to think about. Uh, quite often, uh, these calls are going to be crime scenes. If you have somebody who stabbed or shot, whether they did it to themselves or somebody else, somebody else inflicted the injury on them. These are crime scenes. So how does that change what we do? Number one, we're not going to enter that crime scene until the law enforcement goes in and tells us that, that it, the scene's safe for us to enter. Uh, don't disturb evidence if possible. Uh, so what in the world does that mean? Just think back to the beginning of the semester when we talked about as we trauma strip these patients, not taking our scissors and cutting through uh, like bullet holes in clothing, knife holes in clothing, that kind of thing. The bottom line is you have to get to your patient. You have to treat your patient, but do the best you can not to interfere with the evidence. Uh, law enforcement will like you better for that. And in the end, uh, hopefully it will help get somebody bad off the street. Uh, I'm going to use our PPE just like always. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how to stay safe on scenes. Uh, what to do experience is going to help with that. Uh, you can sit at your house and imagine a thousand things and think of what you do and then first call you run that that involves a uh, car wreck. You may have, uh, maybe they had a car wreck because they were gunshot and that caused them to run into a tree. You have penetrating trauma, you have blunt force trauma, you have all these different things working. Makes the job interesting, makes things bad for our patients. Uh, it's kind of why we got into this, right? Back to my speech at the beginning of, the, of this lecture. Determine your number of patients, just like always. Do we need spinal immobilization, immobilization or, or not? Uh, if somebody is, is gunshot and we don't think that the bullet damaged the spinal cord, we may not be worried about spinal immobilization. Always there on the side of caution, I say. Okay, what is your general impression? Is this life-threatening? Is this not life-threatening? Uh, we're going to follow the uh, in non-cardiac arrest. Uh, we're going to follow the circulation airway breathing. I mean, excuse me, we're going to follow airway breathing circulation. So that would be A, B, C, D, E, or it could be X, A, B, C, D, E. The X is exsanguination. We're going to deal with life-threatening hemorrhage immediately. Uh, Penetrating wounds that are sucking chest wounds. Yeah, I know they all suck, but uh, 
just incidentally, a sucking chest wound for to have a sucking chest wound, the the penetration to the to the chest, the hole going from the outside to the inside, if that hole is the same size as the glottic glottic opening, what is that? The hole, the hole between the vocal cords that they breathe through. It's the same size as the glottic opening or larger, then you can have a sucking chest wound. If it's smaller than that, then you're not going to have a sucking chest wound. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be bleeding in there. That doesn't mean that air is not going to be escaping that lung and filling up that pleural space. So that, it just means you don't have a sucking chest wound yet. All right. Uh, level of consciousness, uh, along with that, uh, just right off the bat with your your initial interaction with the patient, grabbing those bilateral radio pulses, looking them in the eye, saying, hi, I'm Buddy, I'm a paramedic. That isn't what you'll say, but I would say, hi, I'm Buddy, I'm a paramedic. What happened to you or what happened today? And get them to answer if they're agitated or if they're confused, those are signs that your patient is hypoxic. And those that's an important sign to note. Uh, we need to try to do something about that if, if possible. Right off the bat, what we would do, uh, Bob, I don't know that the, the firefighter's name, Bob, who's there, but firefighter Bob, can, uh, can you get this patient on a uh, non-rebreather mask for me at 15 liters per minute? Thank you. Then you move right on. So we deal with that right off the bat. Uh, then we move on to that rapid trauma. Uh, start at C7, just so that you're in the habit of doing that. Up over the top of the head, look to see if you have blood on your gloves. Then you assess down the face. Then you check to see if the trachea is midline. Look for jugular venous distension. Now we're going to palpate the clavicles. Then we're going to look for symmetric chest rise. We're going to look to see is breathing shallow. Is the is the chest rise normal? Do we have asymmetric chest rise? And then we're going to palpate the chest to see if we feel crepitus, to see if we feel subcutaneous emphysema. Uh, that is an important finding to note. Uh, then we move on down to the abdomen, right on down to uh, assess the pelvis, and then assess each le each femur down to the knee. Uh, now we've done that rapid trauma. We've we've found and addressed life threats. Uh, we've noted whether our patient's cyanotic or yet or not. We've gotten right on that with some intervention, right? Uh, we note things like accessory muscle use. Are they using the muscles of their neck? And you remember me demonstrating this in class during the respiratory chapter and kind of hyperventilating a little bit and telling you it was cheap drunk. All those goofy things that I do every semester, uh, that's part of this primary assessment. Are they? Do we see retractions? Do we see the intercostal muscles? squeezing down between the ribs when our patient tries to breathe? Are they using their neck muscles to try to pull that chest up? They're fighting to try to breathe. Those are important things to notice. Uh, how, do the, how do the jugular veins look? Are they distended and engorged or are they flat? If they're engorged, that in our assessment, that's going to tell us that we have poor venous return to the heart from the upper body. Then we need to determine what's causing that. If they're flat, that goes along with a patient who has bled out and is in hypovolemic shock. That would go along with a hemothorax where they've lost maybe up to that 25% of their circulating blood volume into the thoracic cavity, that would, that would cause those flat neck veins. And then the, the uh, distended neck veins, jugular venous distension, that goes along with a tension pneumothorax, pericardial tamponade, a... Uh, myocardial contusion, things that are interfering with 
the refill of the heart uh, and that causes the blood to back up. I have some pictures, maybe even a little video of that in a minute that, that will help that make more sense. Assess those. Uh, is their airway good? Uh, is their breathing within normal limits? Uh, is, are they having, are they dyspneic? What can we do to intervene and fix that? Uh, what is their circulatory status? Uh, at the same time we're doing this in this primary survey, we can have somebody go ahead and start to get a good baseline set of vital signs for us so that we have that information available to us early on. We're not waiting until we're doing that second full secondary survey that involves getting a complete set of vital signs. We already have that cooking. We already have somebody taking care of that for us so we can get that information back as quickly as possible. That is going to help direct the treatment of our patients. Overall appearance, what does that mean? Do they look like they're FTD? Fixing to die. That is an important thing to note. Do they do they look FTD or they look normal? Uh, are they telling you they're dying and you're looking at them and they look hopefully better than I do sitting here talking into the stupid camera? Okay, uh, clear patent airway. All this is happening fast, right? If they need cervical stabilization and immobilization, immobilization we get somebody on that right away. We we point to a specific person on our team, have them grab C-spine. They don't let go of that until we have full spinal immobilization in place. Are the jugular veins distended? Let's see what that looks like. This is a good time to see it, I think, if it will work. There we go. Okay, as it as it boots up here, you know what a normal flat neck looks like, right? You know what normal looks like. So if this will roll on through you. Okay, we don't need to be worried about all that. What what I'm concerned with is that you, okay, we're going to close that down. I'll get back to my PowerPoint. I'll go away. I'm trying. Technology's kicking my butt today. All right, here we go. Back to, oh, no, no, no. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're back. Whew, that was a close call. Okay, uh, what did I want you to see? I wanted you to see what a distended jugular vein looks like. In a full medical assessment, it's a long process to assess, properly assess jugular venous distension. That's not what I'm worried about here. You can look and see that those jugular veins on that man in that video are distended. I, for my purposes, with, with emergency treatment of chest trauma, I don't care if you know that there, that there is an external jugular vein and an internal jugular vein. We'll worry about that in paramedic school. Right now, you just need to see that that vein that's normally kind of, you, you can't even maybe see it very much. You see that that sucker that can be the size of your patient's pinky finger or bigger is it's engorged with blood. That blood is from the upper body is not draining back down into the right side of the heart. It's not, blood's not moving out of the superior vena cava into the right atrium and then being moved through the heart. So that's what I'm talking about there. I thought a little video might help. Okay, uh, and then as, and we're going to evaluate their breathing. Uh, if it's if it's not deep enough, we're going to bag a system. If they're breathing too slowly, we're going to bag a system at the appropriate rate. How much do we bag them? We bag enough to get chest rise, right? We're not we're not 
We don't have them intubated on the ventilator, and we're setting tidal volume at 350, 400 milliliters of air. We're just getting chest rise, just like with CPR. That's all there is to assisting ventilation. We provide ventilation at the appropriate rate and enough to get chest rise. That's what we're doing here. We're always going to use a reservoir, uh, a BVM that has a reservoir that's connected to oxygen. Run that wide open so that you keep that that reservoir bag inflated, and we're delivering almost 100% O2. So whatever we're getting down into the alveoli that are participating in ventilation, we have the highest FiO2 or percentage of inspired oxygen possible to get all that we can into, into the bloodstream so that we so that there's the most oxygen possible sitting there to, to bam, attach to that hemoglobin to be driven throughout the body and then offloaded. All right. Enough of that sermon. Look for good equal expansion of the chest wall. We're also looking for paradoxical motion. That comes with a flail chest that comes with two or more consecutive ribs fractured in two or more places. Let's see what that looks like. That is an impressive flail segment there. That's what we call that floating piece of chest wall is pushing down onto the surface of the lung. Uh, that's uh, that is and that's that is interfering with full expansion of that lung that's mashing down that's called ca causing atelectasis that's that's compressing alveoli so that they can't inflate they can't stay inflated uh, when we have when a patient's body has sufficient surfactant, that is the substance that causes the alveoli to stay inflated. In a normal situation, the alveoli stay inflated even when air isn't moving down into them because of ventilation. So absent, with an absence of surfactant, you have atelectasis, you have alveoli that collapse. You could also have mechanical atelectasis. In that case, that's when that when that flail segment in that video is pushing down onto the lung and flattening out those alveoli. So we decrease the available the air available in ventilation to cause oxygenation. How do we treat that? We support ventilations. Again, we're right back to positive pressure ventilation to help deal with that flail segment. We're not taping dressings on that. We're not putting sandbags on it. We don't do any of that anymore. We're just using positive pressure ventilation to provide the maximum ventilation as deep in the lungs as possible, hopefully forcing that flail segment back out so that we get sufficient tidal volume to uh, oxygenate our patient. Okay. Uh, every time we reassess, we're going to reassess the effectiveness of our ventilatory support. We can constantly do that. We can see if we have good chest rise. We can see if the color of our patient improves. Are they, is our patient still cyanotic? Or has that has their color improved? We know if we have if effective ventilatory support for our patients, and we're always watching for the signs of the development of attention pneumothorax. Uh, what is their pulse rate and quality? Is their pulse is their pulse regular? Uh, is the rate appropriate? Uh, is it a weak thready pulse or is it a full bounding pulse? Those things are important clinical signs for us. What is the skin color? What is the skin temperature? 
Uh, remember that we have cool, pale, diaphoretic skin in shock. And normally we have, we have warm, pink, dry skin in darker pigmented skin. Uh, people who, uh, uh, say African Americans, uh, uh, Hispanic patients who have darker skin. If the skin is is dark and it's difficult to tell to tell what the skin color is, we can always look and look in their mouths and look at the color of that oral mucosa. Is it pink? Is it blue? I mean, by blue, I mean is it cyanotic? I don't mean are they a Smurf? That's a whole different ballgame. Okay, what is their level of consciousness? Were they agitated before because they were hypoxic or confused because they were hypoxic? And now we're, we're assisting ventilations with positive pressure ventilation. Now they pinked up. Now they're not as agitated. They're not as confused. Uh, the other tool we have available would be our, our SPO2. Uh, we're checking that pulse oximetry. Uh, and then uh, if you have the equipment in tidal CO2 is going to tell you more about respiration in our patients than our SpO2 monitor is going to tell us. Okay, a deadly dozen. I don't expect you to memorize these, but I want you to know how to find them and understand what they're doing to our patients. So airway obstruction, bronchial disruption, how would we know that? That's going to be difficult pre-hospitally, uh, other than we find a patient with chest trauma and they have subcutaneous emphysema, they have diminished breath sounds or absent breath sounds on one side. That would give you a clue that that's what's going on. It's difficult to diagnose. Diaphragmatic tear, that is going to impair our patient's ventilation. Uh, we'll talk more about diaphragmatic tear in the next chapter. Esophageal injury, what are we going to find with that? Uh, pain in the chest, and, uh, and in that case, we could find subcutaneous emphysema also. That's the Rice Krispie. Uh, you palpate the chest, and you feel it feels like Rice Krispies popping, uh, like, or little, uh, if you had a little bitty bubble wrap, and you pushed and and it popped when you pressed on it. Uh, it could be subcutaneous emphysema type feeling. Uh, you can feel it just below the clavicles. You can feel it in the axillary area of your patients. That's why we want to palpate up in those armpits in our patients with chest injury to see if we feel that subcutaneous emphysema. And then we want want to come down and do a good job of assessing the chest they can even have enough subcutaneous emphysema that they have sub-Q air all up their chest and into their necks and up into their jawline. Uh, you can find some really serious sub-Q emphysema. That tells us there's air in the chest. It could be from an esophageal injury. More likely, it's from a pneumothorax. It could be from a tension pneumothorax. The more air that we have accumulated in the chest, the more air we have that makes it up into that subcutaneous air area. And then when you palpate it, you feel that popping feeling. And then we're looking for flail chest. We're looking for that paradoxical motion. Uh, that's one of the deadly dozen cardiac tamponade. We've mentioned blood filling up the sac that surrounds the heart. Uh, thoracic aorta dissection uh, have that tearing chest pain that radiates through to the back. They have, that's why we, and this is why, I'm going to talk about this right now so I don't forget it. With patients with chest trauma, always get a blood pressure in both arms to see if that's the same. A patient with an aortic dissection or an aortic tear not the ones that bleed out and they're dead on the scene, the ones that survive long enough for us to assess them, a, a sign of aortic dissection is the is the, a difference in blood pressure from one arm to the other. When would you do that? You're going to do that as 
after you've treated life threats and you're moving on down into that full secondary survey, that's when we're going to get a blood pressure in both arms. That's an important thing for us to do. Uh, myocardial contusion, that's the bruise to the heart muscle itself, and then pulmonary contusion, that is to the lung itself. Deadly dozen, those are things, chest injuries, that can be lethal to our patients. Now we've made it through a full, uh, we've, we've made it through looking for those life threats. We start to investigate the uh, chief complaint. Uh, we look for signs that we see. We look for, and then we, there are symptoms that our patient tells us about. And then pertinent negatives. These are important. Our patient has obvious blunt force trauma to their right chest, but uh, they, they didn't, you say something like the patient has a large contusion just inferior to, in the anterior chest, just inferior to the, to the right nipple. Uh, the patient denies any difficulty breathing, denies any shortness of breath. Uh, no paradoxical motion is noted. Uh, and patient has full symmetric chest rise. Pertinent negatives, those are things that aren't present that tell us something about our patient as we assess them. So deny shortness of breath. They, uh, they deny any pain to the chest. Uh, we, don't, we, note, we don't note any intercostal retractions. Uh, no, uh, no paradoxical motion is, is noted. Those are pertinent negatives. Those are important in a full patient assessment and writing up our complete uh, patient care report, our PCR. Then sample history, if we can get it, don't hold up and waste time on scene with a critical trauma patient trying to find somebody to tell you whether they had their tonsils and adenoids removed when they were a kid uh, or if they've had all their all their all their childhood immunizations. We're not doing all that stuff. We're, and then uh, look at the mechanism of injury. What, what, does us, what does that make us think as far as injuries our patient might have? What is that? That's the end, that index of suspicion. Uh, if they have an isolated injury, after you've done a full head-to-toe DCAT BTLS assessment, you can focus on that isolated injury. We're not going to trauma strip somebody who ran into the corner of a table or ran into a corner of a countertop and and has an isolated uh, isolated chest trauma. They maybe they have a broken rib. They don't need to be trauma stripped and have that full that full DCAT BTLS, but you're still going to do a good head-to-toe assessment of them. And, and then uh, what is that patient's complaint? We're going to address that complaint. Focus in on the body region affected. If we've determined that the right chest is the only body area affected by whatever trauma that they suffered, the gunshot wound of the chest, it's a through-and-through through anterior to posterior, just below the right nipple, it went in there, you have an exit, you have an entrance wound there, you have an exit wound in the back. We can focus on that body area in our assessment and then for, uh, on down the line as we reassess and as we monitor our patient, we're going to watch for uh, the possibility of a, of a tension pneumo developing, but we're, we're not going to... Uh, we don't have to fully assess the entire body every time. Again, I we say it twice because it's important. Assess the anterior and posterior aspects of the chest wall. You look for any changes in their ventilations as you go. If you're bagging that patient, does bag compliance increase? Do they get dif difficult to bag? 
What does poor bag compliance mean? That means I try to squeeze that bag as I've been ventilating them, and now it's hard to squeeze the bag because the pressure in the chest is going up. That is important to note. That is that requires somebody to poke a needle in the chest probably or a surgeon to crack the chest open and fix whatever's going on. Okay. Get their vital signs. Uh, we'll talk more about vital signs in a minute. Uh, we're going to auscultate the lungs as part of this. Uh, again, even though we did a quick listen, uh, Apex, apex, base, base, base. We're going to listen more. And then as we reassess them, we're going to listen to their breath sounds every time as part of getting, getting a set of vital signs. And we're going to include assessing their pupils as part of that. A hypoxic brain, with a hypoxic brain, pupillary reaction becomes sluggish. So if your patient had good, crisp pupil constriction when you shine your pen light in it initially, and then we're rolling along, re assessing this critical patient every five minutes. We look at the pupils again, and they're sluggish. They're slow to react. We know that the brain's not getting enough oxygen. Okay, and we're going to reevaluate re uh, re the ABCs. We're going to uh, stay on top of whether they're being perfused well or not, uh, and they're... Uh, their level of consciousness is going to be a good indicator of that. Do they suddenly get agitated or confused? We need to find out what's causing that. How do we find out? We start over with the ABCs in our primary survey, and then we work through into that secondary survey, repeating that again to try to figure out what our patient's problem is. We're going to trend those vital signs. Are their vital signs staying about the same? Or... It, it, is their heart rate going up and their blood pressure dropping as you trim those? Those are important things to note. You have to keep it, you have to stay on top of that. I, okay. Uh, we're always going to reassess our interventions as we reassess. Is that occlusive dressing that we, that we take, uh, taped with three on three sides on the chest is that still in place so that we're not they're not pulling extra air into their chest with that sucking chest wound and then we're going to communicate communicate all of that to the receiving hospital and then document it in our patient care report uh, pneumothorax let's talk about some specific injuries and then we'll wrap up uh, this chest trauma chapter uh, so we know already because you've heard it from me 14 times today. Uh, pneumothorax is accumulation of air in the chest cavity that starts to compress the lung, and that decreases that lung's uh, ability to be oxygenated during ventilation because we're not getting that oxygen down to the alveoli, uh, a portion of the alveoli in the lobes of the lung because of that accumulation of air. Uh, what signs do we see with that or hear with that? We hear diminished breath sounds uh, and eventually maybe absent breath sounds. This is air in the chest. This is the normal lung that has more of a potential space between the, the chest wall and the lung. That air starts to occupy that space, it starts to compress the lung, then eventually in a tension pneumo, it starts to push over to the other side. Okay. Uh, and then I've talked about the open chest wound several times now, that, uh, that open pneumothorax or sucking chest wound Right off the bat, when we find it, we're going to throw that gloved hand over it, right? Then we're going to get the occlusive dressing on it. Most services, uh, no, let me rephrase that. There are there are services out there who don't have the budget to be able to afford to buy these commercial chest seals. That, that chest seal is a one-way valve that only lets air go out, so... With our positive pressure ventilation, as that lung inflates, it has it has the chance of pushing some of that that free air out through that chest seal, 
Let me show you what a chest seal looks like really fast. Ladies, you can admire the the muscles on this man. I didn't fit, I didn't even notice that for two semesters, and then one of the girls in my summer class said, "Oh my gosh, look at that!" But so here you go, eye candy, ladies. No, that's a guitar. It's a smoking hot guitar. Okay. Can you hear the audio on that? Somebody type yes or no for me. Can you hear that? Sorry. Okay, then I'm going to... I can't figure out how to make fix this so you can hear it. So we're going to bounce forward. Like I said, that dude works out. That's supposed to be a bullet wound. He's opening the chest seal. Apparently you need muscles to open that sucker too. That is the chest seal. He's going to wipe off the chest so it sticks. Boom, there it is. He got it off. Now he's going to peel. Now we have exposed adhesive. Now it's, you put that center part that allows the air to go out right over the hole in the chest. And that is an occlusive dressing. It's a one-way valve. It only allows air in. Okay. Back to our friend, the PowerPoint, maybe. Come on, buddy. Where? Okay. How else can we do that? We can do that uh, almost every ambulance. In fact, I think in most states to be a licensed ambulance so that it, you know, ambulance is allowed to transport patients, you have to have Vaseline gauze. The gauze part is worthless in my opinion and in my experience. So what do you do? It comes in a heavy foil packet and you peel that open and you grab a corner of the Vaseline gauze, you pull it off and you throw it in the floor, you throw it out of your way so you don't have to deal with that gooey, messy crap ever again. Then you take that foil packet, fold it over backward so that you can place, and it's heavy, it's like, like super duper heavy aluminum foil. You place that over the wound in the chest and then you tape it on three sides. That does the same thing as that chest seal. It allows it seals the chest when the patient inhales as or when you or when the yeah, when the patient exhales it seals the chest so more air is sucked through into that pleural cavity and then as you provide positive pressure ventilation for that patient hopefully it helps force some of that air out through that one-way valve that we've created. So that is how you use Vaseline gauze. The package is everything. I may get sued by the makers of Vaseline gauze, but I think the gauze is crap. It's, it's hard to get tape to stick to it. It's hard to do what you need to do to it. It's hard to make that three-sided seal that makes that one-way valve, and that one-way valve is important. Okay. Simple pneumothorax doesn't change the cardiac output of our patient. Can be caused by blunt force trauma, causing a fractured rib. It can be caused by penetrating trauma also. If enough air accumulates in the thoracic cavity on that one side, it can start to displace, cause a mediastinal shift. 
everything sitting in the mediastinum that we talked about earlier starts to get pushed over toward the other side. So it starts to decrease cardiac output. It decreases venous return to the right side of the heart. So we've lost, uh, we've lost stroke volume because we don't have an, as much enough blood in the left ventricle to eject out to the body during systole. We also lose some preload because we're not getting the blood flow back to the right side of the heart. So complications start to develop. Uh, as more and more air accumulates, when we always have you look to see if the trachea is midline, a, a deviated trachea, the trachea pushed away from that accumulating pneumothorax and that tension pneumo that's starting to develop. Theoretically, you can see the trachea deviate uh, away from the side of all that air accumulating in the chest. It's really rare to see that. That's a very late sign. Quite often your patient crashes before they get to the point that you see that, that tracheal deviation. That doesn't mean we don't look for it. We always look for it. It just means we might not find it. Even if we don't find it, they can have a substantial pneumo that's killing them right in front of us and we need to treat it. We need to get some more help there to help us treat it. All right. Uh, so that's what's happening. It starts to cause that mediastinal shift, starts to compress the heart, starts to compress the aorta. So we're not moving the blood out of the heart that we have. What we have available in stroke volume is not being circulated to the body because the aorta is getting compressed maybe even getting crimped, that superior vena cava. You can see the inferior down here. Superior is tucked behind the aorta there. I guess, no, no, it goes up here. Here's the, here is the superior vena cava. See, it's being compressed. So that's, that's causing all those problems that we're seeing with that patient. We've got to get that air out of the chest. Personally, I think that pleural decompression should be an EMT skill. Guess what? Nobody has called me to ask me if scope of practice needs to be changed. But I think if we're letting you guys, not letting, you've earned the right by passing this class, passing the National Registry, if you are allowed to administer medications to a patient, and you you should be able to recognize attention pneumothorax and decompress that patient, let that air out. Uh, it could be that you go to work in rural Wyoming and your medical director on his license teaches you to perform pleural decompressions and you have a protocol that allows you to do that. That's okay, but it's not within the normal scope of practice nationwide. So I, even though I think it should be, I'll shut up and move on. Nobody asked me. If they do, I'm going to tell them. Chemothorax. You have that, you have that blood accumulating there. And as that blood accumulates, it starts to do a lot of the same things that this air accumulating is. Quite often, if you have a hemothorax, you have a, a hemonumo. You have air and blood accumulating. So you start to see those same things as a tension hemothorax develops. There is a good chance that your patient is going to become seriously hypotensive because of that blood loss before this thing goes tension, unless there's a lot of air accumulating also. Uh, these patients are in deep weeds. They need a surgeon to get in there and fix whatever the heck is going on. They need a chest tube to get that blood out, but they need surgical repair of whatever's bleeding. Okay, here is 
that representation of all that blood collapsing that lungs, mashing that lung down. So when we hear people say had a collapsed lung, that doesn't mean it was popped like a balloon and it went and all the air went out. It means that air is accumulating and compressing that lung, causing it to collapse. So it's not like like blowing up a balloon and letting it letting it go so the air goes. Okay. And then here's a hemopneumothorax. That's blood and air doing the same thing. All right. Signs and symptoms. Uh, the hemothorax, your patient is going to have signs and symptoms of shock. What are those? That is your, your pale diaphoretic patient who is, they have a rapid pulse. Uh, they have cool, clammy skin. Uh, all of those things that go with compensate, compensated shock. What else are you going to find when we look at the neck and we assess for jugular venous distension? We're not going to find it. They're going to have flat neck veins and have decreased breath sounds on the effective, affected side. Uh, if you were to, I'm sure you've all had a doctor put a finger on your chest, take two more fingers, and bump around on you. That's called percussing. If you did that with a hemothorax, you have a dull thud kind of a feel. With the pneumothorax, when there's air in there, it resonates kind of like a drum when you percuss it. Uh, we don't really teach percussing in an EMT class, but it, it is an important part of this assessment. Uh, but we don't want you to get hung up on that, worried about, am I percussing correctly? Uh, when you percuss with the pneumothorax and you have air in there, we call that hyper resonance, high, high resonance, so it rings more like a drum. And then hypo or low resonance with, with a lot of fluid in there, with blood also being a fluid, you'll get that thud kind of a feel when you percuss. Enough of that. What do these patients need from us? Uh, one thing that needs rapid transport to a trauma center, they need positive pressure ventilation. They need for us to recognize that they need uh, possibly volume replacement. We need to call for ALS, whether it's ground ALS to come to our scene, but we're not going to waste time on the scene. ALS most often is going to meet us on the way. ALS rendezvous, which I always say sounds kind of sleazy. I like ALS intercept because it sounds cool. Sounds like an airplane, like a fighter jet intercepting another one. It says cool things like I like. Uh, rendezvous sounds sleazy. My wife doesn't let me have those. So, uh, and she shouldn't. All right. So, uh, or it could be air ambulance. It could be a helicopter coming to our scene and rapidly transporting that patient to a trauma center. We don't decompress these. We're not going to be effective in letting this blood out. It's just going to bleed more. So, all right. Uh, cardiac tamponade. We're about to wrap up chest trauma here. Uh, that protective membrane, that sac that the heart sits in that has a, has pericardial fluid in it that that keeps friction down as the heart pumps, keeps from rubbing a hole in the heart or irritating the heart by rubbing on something. There's bleeding in there for some reason, maybe blunt force trauma, uh, ruptures some veins on the surface of the heart and that muscle starts bleeding and that blood starts to fill up that pericardium and you have, uh, and as that blood accumulates, it decreases the refill of the ventricles. After systole, when it squeezes down, normally we have diastole and the heart fills up with blood and gets ready for the next systole. If we have blood accumulating in the pericardium or any fluid for that matter, it can impair ventricular refill. That decreases cardiac output, 
because it decreases stroke volume. Remember, cardiac out output is stroke volume times heart rate. Uh, stroke volume, we can't exactly me measure in the field, but we want that full refill. Frank Starling's law, what in the heck is that? Uh, if you've taken anatomy or if you go on and take the advanced class, we'll teach you that the more you stretch the heart muscle, the harder it contracts. That's Frank Starling's law. The opposite of that would be the less you stretch the heart muscle, then the, the, the softer the contraction, I guess that's the best word I can come up with because I got, I started rambling a little bit. You're used to that by now. It's okay. It keeps it interesting. Okay. If the, if the heart doesn't fill up as much, it doesn't stretch as much, so it doesn't contract as hard. That's what I was trying to say. Beck's triad is a sign of pericardial tamponade. Uh, you can't hear this video. Uh, maybe I'll narrate it. Let's do it. Come on, baby. Let's go. You love my narrations anyway, right? Okay. No, but good God, that's loud to me. Intro, intro, intro. Uh, U.S. medical licensure examination. You're not taking that, but it's a good video here. So we have a heart. And diastole, uh, that that heart fill, that heart muscle fills up, the ventricles fill up, and then when it squeezes down, it ejects that blood. There's a pericardial sac around the heart, and oh, good lord, that's loud. Uh, so, oh no, okay, we're not going to do this. I'm hearing like, okay, here we go. It was showing twice. Again, there's the heart. Well, hopefully you can see this. Fills di during diastole, and then during systole, it ejects the blood from the ventricles. You have the pericardial sac surrounding the heart. Normally, it doesn't interfere with the refilling of the heart. It's tough, fibrous protection. Now you see that pericardial sac is filling up with blood. So it fills, as it fills, it compresses the heart. So during diastole, there's not room for the heart to refill. And it decreases stroke volume or end diastolic volume because it doesn't fill as much. So we don't eject as, as much blood. That causes blood pressure to decrease. It causes the systolic pressure to go down. Uh, lots of pressures, don't worry about those. So as the pressure increases, they can't refill because that pressure is increasing the pressure inside the heart that decreases the ability to refill. So what that causes is the systolic pressure goes down and the diastolic pressure essentially stays the same. So pulses paradoxicus, paradoxicus is one sign of pericardial tamponade. That means when the patient inhales, the systolic pressure decreases by 10 millimeters mercury or greater. What does that mean? Uh, the two, the diastolic pressure and the systolic pressure start to 
approach one another. So as the ventricle, left ventricle can't refill, that starts to cause blood to back up on the right side of the heart. And that causes distended neck veins in our patient. And that's the end of that one. That was a horrible narration. Let's just go back to our slides. I'm getting better at that part. It's a good video, I wish you could watch it. Okay, let's try this again with these slides. That's normal. That is blood around the heart. Bex triad, remember that term, Bex triad, you see jugular venous distension. We learned about that at the beginning of the lecture. You hear muffled heart tones. Why? You're listening to the heart tones through fluid around the heart, so sound isn't transmitted as easily through that fluid. How do you know what, how do you know if they're muffled? You need to listen to a lot of heart tones, so listen to your chest. As you do your clinical, listen to patients' heart tones. I'm not worried about you finding heart murmurs, that kind of thing. I want you to learn what normal heart tones sound like, then I want you to listen to your patients, and if you have a patient with chest trauma, you listen to their patients, you listen to their heart tones. If those sound like you're listening to sound coming through a water balloon, then you, you have, your patient has muffled heart tones. Narrowing pulse pressure, uh, it's difficult in our world to, to Properly, properly assess this narrowing pulse pressure. Your book does say that that's part of this assessment. That means the, the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure are getting closer to one another. Uh, in actual practice, the, that happens when pressure increases in the chest, when our patient inspires, they take a deep breath, and that pressure in the chest increases, that pushes down on that blood in the pericardial sac, and that decreases that refill, and that causes that narrowing pulse pressure. Altered mental status is going to go with this. How do we treat this? First, we have to recognize it, then we so support ventilations, we provide rapid transport to a trauma center, and uh, that would, and then uh, also let's include in that uh, ALS back up to our scene, ALS intercept on the way, or ALS via air medical. Okay, rib fractures, uh, very common in old people. Uh, this is kind of the beginning of the end for a lot of old people. They have a fall. When they fall, they strike something, such as the corner of a coffee table or an end table, something like that. They fracture some ribs. They have simple rib fractures. They're not displaced. They don't have a flail segment. They don't have any of those things. They don't develop a pneumo. What happens? They have rib fractures. They guard by not breathing as deeply because it hurts. So they start to develop pneumonia. That infectious process gets going. And then eventually they die of septic shock. That is, so that's what I mean by the beginning of the end. In, in our non-elderly population, our non-geriatric patients, how are we gonna treat this? We can give them a pillow to hold on their chest, to splint those fractured ribs, put supplemental oxygen on them, put that non-rebreather on them, encourage them to take a full deep breath. And then we need to assess to see if they have a pneumothorax, if they may develop a tension pneumo, maybe even a hemothorax or a hemo pneumo. Localized tenderness on palpation. So they have that point tenderness when we palpate it. They may not have crepitus with it, 
or they may have that localized pain. Localized means it's in one place instead of generalized all over the place. So as they take a deep breath, it hurts. They have rapid shallow respirations. They're trying to keep up their, their minute ventilations. So they breathe faster to compensate for that lower tidal volume. So those are signs and symptoms of a rib fracture. Uh, treat it with supplemental oxygen. Give them something to kind of splint that chest. We're not going to take an elastic wrap and put a real tight wrap around their chest like you see in the movies or on the sideline in football games, that kind of stuff. That compromises chest wall expansion so we can cause the, cause the additional problems that we're trying to prevent. Okay. We watched the video on flail segment. We've talked about it several times. We know exactly what that does. That detached portion, that flail segment, pushes down into the lung and that collapses alveoli, and maybe even there's a pulmonary contusion that goes with it that has swelling, causes even bleeding within the alveoli, and that decreases the patient's ability to ventilate themselves. That decreases our ability to ventilate them properly with positive pressure ventilation, even though that's our treatment for it. We maintain their airway, uh, get them on a non-rebreather, uh, until we get that, get our our bag valve mass connected to our oxygen supply, and then we're going to provide positive pressure ventilation at the normal rate of 10 to 12 a minute, enough to get good chest rise, uh, and then we're going to fully assess them, and we're going to transport them to a trauma a trauma center. Okay. Pulmonary contusion we've talked about uh, pretty extensively already. We know what it's doing. We know the pathophysiology of a pulmonary contusion now. Uh, what do we do for it? Supplemental oxygen and positive pressure ventilation if needed. Sternal fractures. Man, with the sternal fracture, we're going to be looking for uh, have that index of, high index of suspicion. Get that in your head. That's an important term. So that mechanism of injury that caused a sternal fracture that we found on our assessment, now we have a high index of suspicion of uh, possibly pericardial tamponade, possibly uh, myocardial contusion, maybe a, a pulmonary contusion uh, could cause injury to the great vessels. So we have to... Uh, have to evaluate those patients and recognize the pathophysiologies caused by it, which we've already talked about, and treat those appropriately, and rapid transport to a trauma center. Clavicle fractures can also damage that neurovascular bundle up there by the clavicle. Our patients are pretty much going to use their arm, hold it close to their chest, and splint like self-splint, that fractured clavicle. They don't want to move. They don't want it to move. They're going to breathe more shallowly. We need to watch for a possible pneumothorax developing. We can take a cravat and we can secure their arm to their chest snugly so that helps them splint that, right? We can, at the same time, uh, put... Uh, sling and swath around, actually before we put the cravat on, put a sling and swath around to help hold that arm in that condition, in that position where they're splinting it, then put that, that uh, cravat around them, that would be the swath part, so we sling it, we swath it to hold it in place and keep them from having to try to contract their muscles over a long transport to hold that in place, and then a smooth ride, uh, assess and reassess to watch for the development of a pneumothorax. Traumatic asphyxia, uh, Perthes syndrome, what is this? Our patient suffers a massive crushing mechanism of injury to their upper thorax, and that forces blood 
up out of the right side of the heart. So the right ventricle causes that pressure pushes blood up into the right atrium, and then that forces blood back up the superior vena cava out into the capillaries eventually, and all of that that venous blood being pushed out causes that purple color, that uh, that just m massive cyanotic look. Uh, patients can survive this. Uh, quite often, this is a serious enough mechanism of injury that you just have a devastating internal injury to the patient, and and they succumb to their injuries, but they keep this purple color appearance because that venous blood has been forced out into the tissue, and they they continue to to have that color. Uh, they also get uh, petechial hemorrhages. They get little uh, blood is forced out of the little capillaries in their sclera, the white of their eye. So you get little red dots in the sclera. Those are petechial hemorrhages. That all goes with this traumatic asphyxia. Uh, it is it is a horrendous injury. Uh, can be caused in an industrial setting. Could be caused in a car wreck. Could be caused. I've seen it when somebody is, let's say, somebody's working on a vehicle without having jack stands under it. They haven't taken the appropriate uh, safety measures, and a vehicle falls on their chest, and they have traumatic asphyxia that forces that blood out into the tissue. Uh, that's actually that's the time I've seen it most. I've occasionally seen it in a, a MVC with a with an unrestrained uh, occupant in the vehicle but that crushing injury uh, is that's the most prevalent uh, in my practice anyway okay how do we treat that? If our patient happens to not be dead on the scene from this, how do we treat this? Ventilatory support, supplemental oxygen, ventilatory support, uh, that is positive pressure ventilation. We're going to monitor their vital signs. Rapid transport, call for ALS, whether it's ground or air, that is going to give your patient a chance of survival. Without that aggressive treatment and that rapid transport, they're gonna they they may not have much of a chance of survival. Blunt myocardial injury that can cause the pericardial tamponade that we've talked about that can cause the 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 myocardial contusion, cardiac contusion that we talked about. Uh, those patients with that that myocardial contusion. They can present uh, similar to having uh, cardiac chest pain, like we learned about back before spring break. Uh, they have that squeezing pain in the chest. Uh, they, they're, they're diaphoretic, they're pale, and they have an irregular pulse because of the interference with the conduction system of the heart. Uh, these patients need ALS, they need rapid transport, uh, th there are medications that can, can be given to possibly deal with with the the underlying uh, cardiac dysrhythmia, the disruption in that electrical conduction system. Medications that can be given to possibly deal with that. Uh, medications that can be given to deal with the pain. Uh, if you have a patient with blunt force trauma, they're having chest pain. Stay away from the, the nitro as EMTs. We don't want to cause their pressure to bottom out. Uh, this patient has massive trauma to the chest. Remember that nitroglycerin works by causing vasodilation. If we cause systemic vasodilation, they have bleeding in the chest besides that that that. Uh, myocardial contusion, we can bottom their blood pressure out and and cause them to go into cardiogenic shock. So 
we need to call for ALS, whether it's ground intercept, whether it's ground ALS to our scene, or it's uh, air ambulance, uh, helicopter, uh, they need ALS. Okay, what's our treatment? Monitor their pulse, feel for that irregular pulse, uh, note changes to the blood pressure, provide supplemental oxygen, rapid transport, involve ALS. The last one we're going to talk about is Commodio cortis. Uh, that's that that big lizard in my mind. Hopefully, you're always going to think of me. When you think of Commodio cortis, you're going to think about that stupid idiot EMT instructor that I had that talked about the, about the giant lizard. It's not a giant lizard. That's a Komodo dragon. What is this? This is a sudden impact of the chest, a direct blow to the chest during a critical portion of the the EKG waveform, the, the electrical cycle of the heart during repolarization of the ventricles. When electrically the ventricles are getting reset so that they can receive another electrical impulse to contract on the second half of that repolarization period, if you have a sudden impact to the chest, it can cause them to immediately go into ventricular fibrillation and you have a dead patient unless you can defibrillate that patient within the first two minutes of that injury. Well, you know how to do that, right? You know how to run an AED. You don't have to be a paramedic to do this. Uh, know where AD, AEDs are, uh, baseball fields, uh, hockey games, those rodeos, those kinds of places. They need to have AEDs for this reason. If we can defibrillate these patients with that AED within that first two minutes, it's over a 90% likelihood that that patient is going to convert with that defibrillation, go back to a perfusing rhythm, and do extremely well because they didn't have underlying heart disease. They weren't having an MI that caused this. They just had that impact to the chest. That impact to the chest delivers elect an electrical impulse through the chest. That's what causes this problem. Electricity fixes it, right? Uh, other things that go with that, uh, what mechanisms of injury that cause that? So uh, this happens, you read about it about once a year in some of the American Heart publications, uh, baseball player, even a little league player, they deliver a pitch. There's a line drive from the batter back to the pitcher. The pitcher doesn't react quickly enough, and that ball impacts right in the center of the chest and causes them to immediately go into ventricular fibrillation. A hockey puck could do the same thing. Uh, a kick to the chest in karate, being kicked by a bull or a horse. All of those could do the same thing, a punch to the chest. So that's the mechanism of injury that causes us. The treatment is CPR followed by quick defibrillation with an AED or at the paramedic level with a cardiac monitor defibrillator. Okay. Laceration of the great vessels. Uh, Quite often that can be a, a fatal hemorrhage. If it's not fatal, how do we recognize it? That tearing pain in the chest that radiates through to the back uh, causes, uh, causes hypotension. You have unequal blood pressures in the arms possibly, uh, you, and uh, the patient so that's how you recognize it. That that's what that's what you see with the patient. Uh, if they go into cardiac arrest, they need immediately immediate CPR. If they don't go into cardiac arrest, they need supplemental oxygen. They need a smooth ride to the hospital. Don't withhold positive pressure ventilation, but don't get real aggressive. We don't want to do anything to increase that tear that causes them to immediately go into cardiac arrest. Permissive hypertension. We're not going to put this patient immediately in the shock position with his legs elevated uh, and his head flat. We, we want to 
avoid having too much pressure. If that's a if that's a uh, aortic tear, then we want to avoid having too much pressure there that might cause that to go ahead and tear more and cause our patient to bleed out and die. All right. And that is the end of that portion of our dog and pony show. Let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, remember when we come back, we're going to go to session two so that this video stops now and we don't have a four hour video up there on YouTube. Almost impossible to manage. So I'm going to stop the recording now. I think I have a question here. Uh, is there a quiz this weekend? Yes, I'll try to get a quiz together for you. Thank you for reminding me. Then we'll have an exam on Monday. All right, let me shut this recording down.